Oh, I'd rather not spend the night here alone. Uh, what? Oh, a cat. Uh, yeah, here, kitty kitty. Here, kitty kitty. Hmm. I suppose you're not a talking cat. Uh, of course not. Uh, Where are you going? My little company is better than none. Wait! The cat led him through the tombs and out on the desert side of them. There it sat down bolt upright with its tail curled round its feet and its face set towards the desert and towards Narnia and the north as still as if it were watching for some enemy. Shasta lay down beside it with his back against the cat and his face towards the tombs. Because if one is nervous, there's nothing like having your face towards the danger and having something warm and solid at your back. Very soon, he fell asleep. Though even in his dreams, he kept on wondering what had happened to Bree and Aravis and Huynh. It's only a nightmare. I hope it's not more lions. Whatever they are. And there's more than one of them. And they're coming nearer. I suppose that if Shasta had been an entirely sensible boy, he would have gone back through the tombs nearer to the river where there were houses, and wild beasts would be less likely to come. But to go back through the tombs would mean going back past those dark openings in the tombs and what might come out of them. It may have been silly, but Shasta felt he'd rather risk the wild beasts. Then as the cries came nearer and nearer, he began to change his mind. He was just going to run for it, when suddenly, between him and the desert, a huge animal bounded into view. As the moon was behind it, it looked quite black. And Shasta didn't know what it was, except that it had a very big shaggy head and went on four legs. It didn't seem to have noticed Shasta, for it suddenly stopped, turned its head towards the desert, and let out a roar which echoed through the tombs and seemed to shake the sand under Shasta's feet. The cries of the other creatures suddenly stopped, and he thought he could hear feet scampering away. Then, the great beast turned to examine Shasta. It's a lion. I know it's a lion. I'm done. I hope it doesn't hurt much. There it comes. I can't bear to look. But instead of teeth and claws, he only felt something warm lying down at his feet. And when he opened his eyes again, he said, The cat? I must have dreamed the entire thing. Dream or not, I'll never do anything nasty to a cat again, as long as I live. I did once, you know. And I threw stones at a half-starved, mangy old strength. <coughs> Ow! Hey, stop that! You scratched me! What's got into you? The cat stared at him with big, green, unwinking eyes. And he at once lay down again, back to back with the cat, as they had been at the beginning of the night. The warmth spread all over him. Then he dozed off. I think. As they drew nearer, the figure turned its head and showed them a long, thin face with rather sunken cheeks, a tightly shut mouth, a sharp nose, and no beard. He was wearing a high-pointed hat like a steeple with an enormously wide, flat brim. The hair, if it could be called hair, which hung over his large ears, was greeny-gray and each lock was flat rather than round, so that they were like tiny reeds. Although his body was not much bigger than a dwarf's, he had very long legs and arms, which would have made him taller than most men when he stood up. 
The fingers of his hands were webbed like a frog's, and so were his bare feet, which dangled in the muddy water. He was dressed in earth-colored clothes, which hung loose about him. His expression was solemn, his complexion muddy, and you could see at once that he took a very serious view of life. Good morning, guests. And you. Good morning. Though when I say good, I don't mean it won't probably turn to rain, or it might be snow, or fog, or thunder. You didn't get any sleep, I dare say. Yes, we did, though. We had a lovely night. Ah, I see you're making the best of a bad job. That's right. You've been well brought up, you have. You've learned to put a good face on things. Uh, please, we don't know your name. Paddleglum's my name, uh. but it doesn't matter if you forget it, I can always tell you again. Uh. I'm trying to catch a few eels to make an eel stew for our dinner. Oh, I shouldn't wonder if I didn't get any. And you won't like them much if I do. Oh, why not? Why? It's not in reason that you should like our sort of victuals, though I've no doubt you'll put a bold face on it. All the same, while I am catching of them, if you two could try to light the fire, no harm trying. The wood's behind the wigwam. It may be wet. You could light it inside the wigwam, and then we'd all get the <coughs> smoke in our eyes. Oh. Or you could light it outside, and then the rain would come and put it out. Here's my tinder box. Thank you. You won't know how to use it, I expect. Something was moving there. Oh, look at them all! Every kind of creature in Narnia must be coming our way. Oh. Out of the shadows of the trees, racing up the hill for dear life, by thousands and millions, came talking beasts, dwarfs, satyrs, fauns, giants, colormans, archenlanders, monopods, and strange unearthly things from the remote islands of the unknown western lands. And all these ran up to the doorway where Aslan stood. It's like a dream. I say, Jill, have we become smaller? Or has that door become much bigger? I think... Oh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, does it? The creatures came rushing on, their eyes brighter and brighter as they drew nearer and nearer to the standing stars. But as they came right up to Aslan, one or other of two things happened to each of them. They all looked straight in his face. I don't think they had any choice about that. And when some looked, the expression of their faces changed terribly. It was fear and hatred, except that on the faces of talking beasts, the fear and hatred lasted only for a fraction of a second. You could see that they suddenly ceased to be talking beasts. They were just ordinary animals. And all the creatures who looked at Aslan in that way swerved to their right, his left, and disappeared into his huge black shadow which streamed away to the left of the doorway. The children never saw them again. But the others looked in the face of Aslan and loved him, though some of them were very frightened at the same time. And all these came in at the door, in on Aslan's right. 